Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Minority Reports Podcast and Digital Series. I am your host, Mona Shake, you guys. You know what's up. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday, James. Happy Friday to everyone tuning in or about to tune in. Um, oh my God, this week, I can't even believe how this week just kind of flew by. Um, I, you know, at first I was like, oh my God, I have such a busy week. I have like so much stuff to do this week. And then next thing you know, I'm just like, oh, it's it's Friday already. Oh my God, where did the week go? Um, but you guys, today um, I have a very special guest. Um, she has been, uh, I, I actually almost crossed paths with her 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we had an indirect uh, crossing of the path when I lived in New York City, since I grew up in New York City, I don't know if you guys know this, but, um, and uh, I decided to bring her on because since then she's been up to very big things. She has been, uh, she directed uh, episodes of Quant uh, of Rami. She directed episodes of Ozark. Um, and I cannot wait to chat with her because she is amazing. Um, just to give, I want to give a fantastic intro for this guest because she really is fantastic. She's a Palestinian American actress, director, producer, and screenwriter. She was named one of Variety Magazine's 10 directors to watch. Yeah, that's right, guys. You are dealing with an OG here. My very talented friend, Shireen Jabez. Shireen, did I say this right? Very close. Uh, very I, close? Very Tell close. What, what did I mess up? Tell me. What well, first name was perfect. Just the last name. It's Diabis. Diabis. But it's D-A-B-I-S though, right? Yeah. That was just my, you know, my dad's way of trying to make life a little easier. <laughs> Listen, I get it. I wasn't born a Mona. I changed to Mona because my legal name is uh, Mavish. And in high school, when I started here, kids used to call me Mavish. Oh wow! And oh, I was wow. like, yeah, I was like, ooh, ooh, I cannot get through high school being called my bitch. Yeah, like this, I, I'm gonna need so much more therapy than I'm going through yeah. right now. <laughs> so much more therapy. Um, uh, but Sharon, welcome. Thank you so you're much. For being animal. First Thank of all, you. how are you? How are you feeling? I know you're recovering from a cold. I'm feeling much better. I'm feeling much better. I'm still like on a super early to sleep, early to rise. <laughs> schedule so I'm a bit yeah. of a granny here on the east coast it's like oh, nine right. in my time and that's true that's I true I had this time last night <laughs> not quite but almost oh man did you do you have one of those like did you have a fever and a cold where you're like having weird dreams in the middle of the night like you know I have had some really weird dreams really weird dreams and I was waking up like continually throughout the night so I would remember yeah. all these weird dreams I would wake up after one and go like did I really just like how random was that dream? Like, why did I dream that? <laughs> is there some truth to those dreams or they're just random? You know, you're reminding me that I actually dreamt last night that my younger sister met a man. And so I need to call her and tell her because I don't think dreams are always that random. Like, I'm part of, okay. I'm like, I'm hoping that this is a premonition <laughs> that I can exactly. assure her that someone's coming. <laughs> you're the minority report for your family. <laughs> Seeing, just seeing all the future right before it happens. You're, uh, you know, yeah, that, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, Shireen, I uh, was uh, reading up about you. Um, just a little thing that you don't know, you might not know. Back in 2010, I auditioned for May in the Summer to play to for the role of May. You're kidding me. Wait, so wait, did you send in a tape? No, I went in person. I had a callback for that. But I was, was I in the room? No, you were not in the room. I don't remember you in the room. So it was a cat, it was with a cat, was it in LA? It was in uh, New York. It was, okay. Oh my God, this that is so crazy. Yeah, and when the movie came out and I was like, makes total sense. I could never, like, <laughs> God's name would I ever play a Jordanian. That's ridiculous. Like, that was a ridiculous thing, the ridiculous casting. Like, no, you know? And when I saw you, I was like, that makes total sense. Shireen should play that character. She is the right person for this role. <laughs> so I remember auditioning for that. So yeah, that was our little indirect uh interaction that we had about 10 years ago uh but you're, you know, yeah your uh 
Your dad's Palestinian, your mom's Jordanian. That's right. And uh, how different, how, it's not that much of a different of a culture. No, no, I mean, you know, it depends on who you ask, but no, not at all. I mean, if, if you start asking like, if you start asking Palestinians, it's like Palestinian culture can vary so much from city to city within, within Palestine, like sure. dialects and, you know, and yeah. that kind of thing. But no, it's it's very similar. All of like kind of the Levantine part of the Arab world is super similar. Khalid, um, however, is different. Uh, yeah, Khalid is different though. Khalid is very different. Khalid is super different. Gulf Arabic, Gulf Arab culture is like a whole different thing. Yes. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of flashiness happening, Shireen. Oh yes, flashiness and so many other things, Mona. <laughs> so many things that make other Arabs and other parts of the region go, hmm. I think it makes yeah. even even Muslims around the world look at Khalid and go, hmm. Yeah. What's going on over there? <laughs> yeah. Why? No. Yeah. Yeah. How much Gucci can one person wear on one day? I know. And like how many malls do you need? And like how big do they need to be? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And why do you need to drive your car on two wheels when it has four? Wait, say that again? <laughs> Why do you have to drive your car on two wheels when it has four wheels? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Why? Why is that? What does that need about? Such good questions. I, I, I would love them answered. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, listen, I, I am just as curious here as uh, you are about that. You know, I uh, was reading this one thing about you that you know you're born and raised uh in um in uh, uh uh in a in um sorry um in uh, ohio. ohio right but you're not born there no i was born in nebraska raised in ohio nebraska. but we, we traveled back to jordan all the time like almost every summer got it so you're so raised, I, where I, in ohio? I was raised back and forth where where in ohio sure a really small town in the northwestern corner called salina it's okay. about an hour north of Dayton. Okay. Yeah. That's not the same as in Nashville, Salina, is it? Na there's a Nashville Salina? There's a Salina in uh, Nashville, uh, in uh, Tennessee, rather. Oh, there's a Salina, Tennessee. Uh, that's there's what I'm saying. Yeah, there's there's no. Well, there's also, I believe, a Salina in Kansas, I think. Oh. I've heard, but it, I think they call it Salina. I've heard. I have, I, I, I have to okay. confirm that. So what makes your parents town name apparently? Yeah. What yeah. makes your parents go, let's go to this pure little town? I know. It's such a strange thing. So my dad had my parents just immigrated to the US right before I was born. Ended up in Nebraska because my dad got a residency there. He, okay. he was at, right out of med school in Cairo, got a residency at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And then like a lot of immigrant doctors, he was recruited to small town Ohio. Right. And when my parents went to go visit there, like in, uh, I don't know, like the late seventies, they were like, oh, it's small and it's quaint and it's peaceful and there's no crime, like literally zero crime. Wow. That's what they were worried about. And I was like, did you consider that there would be zero culture? <laughs> <laughs> they apparently didn't, but they did meet any Arab within a hundred mile radius we knew. So they just, every, you know, we, we had, we had our community. Yeah. Toledo and Dearborn and, you know. Right. Dearborn, Michigan has the highest number of Arab population in the country. That's right. It's, I believe it's the largest um, Arab population outside of the Middle East. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. Dearborn, Michigan is huge. Um, yeah. One of the things you wrote about you, it's a mention in your Wikipedia, is that during the Gulf War in 1990, Secret Service got called to your house? Yeah, well, they actually got called to my high school. Um, the, so the Secret Service came to my high school to investigate a rumor that my older sister threatened to kill the president. How old was your older sister at the time? 17? She was quite threatening to me, but not to really what anyone else. By the way, her name is Fatten. She got made fun of quite a lot in school, as you can imagine. But she never changed her name, which is 
quite awesome. That's my nickname now, Fatten. Uh, no thanks to uh, the pandemic. That's what's happening to me. Right <laughs> I'm uh, working on a shape called the round shape. I think round. Well, you, look, you look pretty amazing. So that's the cutoff right here, Shireen. That's <laughs> like, you can't see me from your low. <laughs> no, no. They're, the camera will not pan down. I refuse to pan <laughs> the camera down, Shireen. Um, so Secret Service gets called um, because so Secret Service, uh, did somebody in the neighborhood puts this complaint in? What went well, down? So what, what we, we don't know anything for certain because it was an anonymous tip that was called in on my sister. But what we think is because she was quite outspoken in her government class uh -huh. and that she would speak out a lot on behalf of the Iraqi people sure, and try to kind of give another perspective of what was happening. Um, and she got a lot of pushback and a lot of hostility in that class. So. So she always, and, and we always kind of thought it was probably one of her classmates from that class that just decided to call her in, that just thought that, I don't know, that her beliefs uh, were anti-American somehow, that she was, you know, somehow threatening to the country as a 17-year-old. <laughs> you know what's disturbing to me that back then we didn't have even have Facebook or Twitter or anything right. like that to post something like that. So for them to just be like anonymous tip, let's go check this out. A 17 year old's trying to assassinate the president or trying to, yeah, I mean, that's ridiculous. It's so utterly absurd. And, you know, luckily the principal of the high school was, um, was wise enough to just know that it was utterly ridiculous and yeah. kept the secret service away from my sister and literally said, uh, you will not go anywhere near her. You will, you will talk to me and, um, if anything happens, I'll take responsibility. <laughs> like that was how wow. certain it was that, which was actually really nice. You know, it's times like, because we experienced such heightened racism in this small town in Ohio during that, you know, that first Gulf War, it's times like that where you really realize who your friends are. So it's kind of, you know, we lost, a, we lost a lot of people we thought were friends and, and neighbors. And, you know, my dad actually lost a lot of his patients, but then people really emerged out of the woodwork to defend us and to be there and support. Wow. 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 Yeah. It's interesting. There's always that balance, right? It's that always that balance. Like, yeah. and I'm glad when people show themselves to be the assholes that they are. I'm like, thank you for really? letting me know you're yeah. an asshole. Thank so, you. I never saw that before. <laughs> yeah, I would not be bringing homemade hummus to your place, so fuck off. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I will no longer explain to you what Palestine is. Precisely. Precisely. Exactly. Don't come to You're me. You're from Pakistan? <laughs> exactly. Are you Pakistanian? Uh, I get the, do you speak Pakistanian? I'm like, first of all, there's no fucking such thing as Pakistanian. And second, like, we speak Urdu. We don't speak Pakistanian. Uh, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. People keep saying I'm Middle Eastern. I'm like, please stop saying that. It's South Asian. Please right. stop right. it. Stop it. We have enough Google to, enough internet to go out there to figure out where Pakistan really is. So please stop it. Um, yeah. Identity crisis. Shireen, that must be a lot of that. That must be a lot of identity crisis. You must guys must be going through. Holy shit. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's uh, identity crisis on top of identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at what age were you like, where do I belong? Like, where where do I belong? Did you have that kind of a thing? Because I went through that. But I, think I, I still do. <laughs> Say that again? I said, I think I still do. <laughs> I think you still just start. At what age? age? Exactly. Zero through now? <laughs> You're like still struggling. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I really struggled with that throughout my teenage years. Um, and and ultimately, I think it's why I do what I do. Like, I, I think at a certain point, I, I just became an observer of things and phenomena and other people and cultures. And I really, it, because I just didn't feel like I ever really fit in, I sort of took a step back and just, I, I became an observer. I just started watching people and things and writing things down, noticing things. And um, so it, I kind of naturally took that you know, that position like behind the lens where I could tell a story where I could watch something unfold. And um, that, that, that's always where I've kind of felt most comfortable to be honest. And I, I think that Gulf War was really a defining moment for me where prior to that, I really wanted to be all American. You know, I was like, can I wake up with blue hair and blue hair, 
but with blonde hair and blue eyes and you know yeah. like that yeah. really wanting to fit in and yeah. and um and then the gulf war happened and i was like okay there's no chance i'm fitting in and i'm clearly not all american and i actually swung the total opposite way and just wanted to be arab i was like can we get out of here please like i don't want to be here i don't belong here why yeah. are we here but right. So it was great because I started to appreciate my my roots, you know, and then at some point I merged the two and realized it was quite a privilege to be able to draw from two different places. Yeah. yeah. Did you speak Arabic growing up? Did your parents teach you Arabic? They did. Yeah. Beautiful. I, at home. I love that. Did you yeah. remember growing up, like when these comments, this, this kind of, you know, you're experiencing this kind of racism at, at school, your parents are experiencing this kind of uh, racism at work. Are you guys coming at home and having these stories and exchanges and being like, dad, mom, I experienced this today. Like, are you guys having these kind of dialogue or? Not all, no, not always. I mean, you know, we were, my, my older sister and I were teenagers at the time. And, um, you know, I had a lot of experiences at school that I, I don't think I ever told anybody about, frankly. Mm. Um, and why my oh, why Shireen? Why do you think that is not true? You know, I think it's like your awkward teenage years, and you know, mm -hmm. like having a friend come up to me and say my brother may have to go to war because of you, just like really paled in comparison to what my parents were going through. Uh, and I and I heard them whispering at night, and I you know I I know that we were getting death threats and that people were leaving you know my dad's office because they didn't want to see an Arab doctor. So I really just sort of kept it to myself and. Um, the things that were bigger deals, we, we definitely talked about. Like two of my sisters have been harassed by the FBI. Um, and well, then of course the Secret Service incident, which actually terrified my older sister at the time. She actually got sick with like a fever of 104 because she was so scared. Jesus, poor thing. So did she was just like, you know what? I'm not gonna talk about it in government class anymore. I'm not gonna defend, or, uh, I mean, she just not shut at all. No, she was more, she's, no, not at all. She was like, this is not gonna shut me up. And she was really scared. And I think like, didn't go to school the next day and you know, got like, literally got really sick. And then when she recovered, she just went right back to like, that's not gonna work. Wow. Um, yeah, which is amazing. She was a senior in high school and like leaving anyway. And now she's like more outspoken than ever. And is she, uh, and what does she do? Is she in the government? She's a lawyer. <laughs> Yes, she is. Is she like I'm a human resource? <laughs> what kind of lawyer? What's that? What kind of law? What kind of law? Well, actually, she hard enough, she's currently working as a contractor for um, in in Illinois. So in a way, it is state government. So it is a little bit, but it, okay. but it's um, but it's also looking at faults in the system. So so she's right. doing interesting work. Right. Uh, one of our uh, uh, viewers, our avid viewer, James said, "The sad thing is that Jordan is a is a U.S. ally." Um, and the fact that, you know, um, fellow um, immigrants from, uh, you know, who are belong to you know, our, our allies are being treated this way. But, you know, what will America be without some racism? Come on now. I know, right? <laughs> Come on. It also, I'm sure, you know, it doesn't help being in a small town where everyone knows, okay, you're Jordanian, but you're Palestinian. Your dad's Palestinian. He's the one that's like kind of the face of the family working as a doctor in town. And then on top of that, his name is Nazi, which is spelled N-A-Z-I-H. So if you've got Nazi in your name and you're Palestinian, things aren't going to go so well in small town Ohio. Bless his heart. Bless his heart, okay, <laughs> that he had, like, had to endure that. You know, it's funny. I have uh, four older brothers. So three of my brothers were um, brought here by, by my mom to get settled around when the Gulf War broke out and my brothers were being told we were told being told my brothers were being told that they're arab and that they are uh being watched uh that the oh. yeah they, they were like oh you, are you guys arab too are you iraqi what are you and they were like we were like we're pakistan they're like same thing you're all the same people you're all the, you're like we've never even been to iraq dude like what like what the hell so everybody's just if you're brown or dark hair Dark features, you're getting roped in. Oh yeah, you're getting you're you're all we're all getting lumped into that same category, especially back then. There's maybe a little bit more nuance now, but that's yeah. even questionable, especially in certain parts of the country. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, so identity crisis. Uh, coming back, I went through identity crisis. My story is a little different than yours because 
I moved at 15 from Pakistan. So that was very different. So I come here and that then I'm very different. am I Pakistani? Am I American? But I'm not Pakistani enough for the Pakistanis and I'm not American enough for the Americans. So like, you're like yeah, you're like in this weird phase. Uh, and then after like 10 years of going through that, I was like, fuck it. I was like, I am whatever I want myself to be because that's the beauty of America. Right. You know, I mean, you're just like, oh shit, that's freedom. I'm gonna, I'm gonna max this out right now. This is great. Um, Amrika, the first time I heard the name of that movie, I was like, somebody gets it. They get it. This is how you pronounce it. My mom, every time would be like, we're going to Amrika. <laughs> and the first time I heard it, I loved it. Um, the, the story of Amrika, is about uh, a Palestinian uh, mom and her son coming to America. Right, Shireen? Ooh. Right. Shireen. That's oh. right. Yeah. You got a little stuck there. Your eyes are closed like you are. Uh, Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, you were like this. <laughs> I was meditating for a moment here. I had to really think about it. I can't. The movie was such a long time ago. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's your first debut feature film. Yes, it was. It came out in 2009. Wow, wow. A lot of good stuff has happened since, so hey. Good stuff, but you know, sadly and interestingly enough, the movie is more relevant today than it was back then. Yep, 100%. Absolutely. Shireen, yeah. you, you were, um, I read uh, that you guys went to visit Palestine uh, and you guys were strip searched for 12 hours. Yeah, that was, I mean, I was like actually a kid at that point. That was like one of my first visits. One of the first visits that I remember because we would we went back a lot when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, well, the first time that I remember going there, we were held at the border. We were crossing through the LNB border crossing, which is the crossing between Jordan and the West Bank. And yeah. that's the crossing that Palestinians have to go through. Um, okay to go into the West Bank. And so, um, yeah, we were held for 12 hours. Uh, my younger sisters who were like babies and infant, like we were all strip searched. Um, our, my mom's makeup was confiscated. Our electronics were confiscated. My dad was screaming at the soldiers. They were screaming at him. And I just remember like, I was like an eight year old, I think at the time. And I was like, I was, I, I really remember just like looking at my dad going like, I don't know if he's gonna die right now. And then when we finally, like after 12 hours and like my younger sisters were like wailing with hunger and we finally like were driving into Jerusalem and I remember poking my head out the window and just like taking in the warm breeze and thinking, man, people really don't like us. Mm. Yeah. Sadly, sadly, as an eight year old, you know, really thinking, yeah. like, wow, we just are, we don't, people don't like us. Yeah. So it was a really formative experience. Yeah, formative to say the least, more like traumatic. Holy that, shit. That. <laughs> like, formative is like a nice way of saying, oh my God, they fuck with my head at that age. Like, what? That's crazy. When you say yeah. strip search, like, what? They take you, they did they strip search your mom too? I, I, I remember my, my recollection is they strip searched everyone, my mom and dad and every, like all of us. So it was, I was, it was literally, it's humiliation, you know, which is what they're, what they're often, what they often do. So yeah, everything, everything came off. So you're eight years old and what? They take you to a special room with like a lady bodyguard, like lady guard. And then she's like, okay, everybody take your clothes off because we don't want any bombs underneath there. Let's go people. Yeah, pretty much. You're taking, I mean, even, even to this day, like I was just in Palestine in October and when I was flying out, um, you know, they, they, they have a special room for Arabs. It's the VIP room. Um, and, and it's where literally like just everything, everything is searched. Like they pull out every piece of lint from your coin purse. They pull, I mean, everything is taken out. I remember at one point, um, the security person took out a chocolate bar and just stared at it for like, I felt like a whole minute. And I just was looking at her and I was like, do you want some? Like chocolate. <laughs> and then I was taken into like a separate room and. And, and just like feel, they, they, they don't make you take your clothes off, but they, they will feel the inside of your trousers, like the seams of your pants, like everything. They'll search your hair. 
Um, they made me take my bra off. I started to lose my temper a little bit around the bra. Like I took it off like I was stripping. I just started going like this. Like, is this what you want? I was like, I can't. I have to try to inject some humor into this because I'm really starting to get angry right now. So, And that's every time, Shireen. Every time you cross the border, every time you have to go through this. It is almost, yeah, on the way. It is, it's different every time, but every time is, you know, every time is something special. <laughs> so what happened? So this is from Jordan to West Bank. So when you leave West Bank, to go back to Jordan, are you going through the same thing? No. Well, the, what happened, the, the thing that I'm talking about actually happened at the Tel Aviv airport. So I, oh. I now often fly in. Oh. Uh, moving through the Jordanian border, um, I, I, will, I will avoid the border that, that Palestinians who have ID cards have to go through because that's the one where they give you the hardest time. Sure. And I'll sometimes go through another border. <laughs> Um, the northern border is a little bit easier, and then flying into Tel Aviv can sometimes be easier, though I'm yeah. usually held at the airport from for anywhere from two to four hours. Every time? Pretty much every time. This last time I went, I was utterly shocked that I it was the first time in my life that I got straight in, and I was like, I, I, I don't know what just happened. I think it was the chocolate bar, sure. <laughs> I think it might have been. You need to bring more chocolate bars. Was it Kit Kat? <laughs> Fried was it, chocolate. Was it, was it a good bar? What was it? Good bar, Kit Kat. Only the best. Toblerones, baby. That's the way to go. Because they also look like pyramids. You know, it's just like Harry you go. Right. right. Like, little pyramid action going on. Unbelievable. This is just ridiculous. Um, so crazy. Um, I know that um, you've been doing. You've been up to a lot of really great stuff. I mean, my goodness. Uh, you were, uh, you co-executive produced uh, Quantico, right? I, what did I do on that? I wasn't a co-executive producer on that. I was a, I think I was a producer. I was a producer. You were a producer on that? I okay. was a writing producer on that for the first season. Got it. Yeah. Um, oh, can you hear me? Ooh, I can. can oh, yeah, okay. Um, so you do Quantico. What was your experience like working on Quantico? Quantico was a little bit nutty. Quantico was, um, uh, it was it was a very interesting, challenging experience, let's just say, especially working on the first season because I think it, it took a while to kind of really figure out what the show was mm. and what it what it was going to be. So it was a bit of a process, and um, and yeah. being in that writers' room was exceptionally challenging. It it, it literally felt like you know. It felt a little bit like being held hostage. <laughs> it was challenging because you guys were trying to navigate your way and figure out what, like the, the the. There were so many pieces of the story. I mean, literally, like I would I would leave the writers' room and I would just have like a massive headache because I just it was it would be like doing story math. It's like doing story math. I felt like we were doing oh, wow. physics all day long because wow. there were so many characters and so many storylines and so many pieces to interweave. And we just had like all of the story up on the board and it was just like, you know, it was a lot of, I mean, the writer's room can be super fun, but this sure. in particular was really challenging just with all of its moving pieces. And, and the showrunner is actually a super brilliant guy. I mean, like, he's just like really smart and he moves really fast and he talks like super fast. He talks so fast that you can barely keep up. And I literally would have to record sometimes the writer's room because I'd be like, I don't know what he's saying because he's talking so yeah, yeah. And it took it took like it took a while for me to really get into the rhythm of how quickly he moved. Sure. And um yeah, it was a I I'm I'm a bit more chill. Yeah, well, you grew up in Ohio. <laughs> yeah, you that you could say that's why. <laughs> Maybe. I, I grew up in New York. When I moved out to LA, people were like you talk too fast. That's really funny. They were like, "Why don't you talk too fast?" So I have to constantly slow myself down because I'm also also always running out of breath because I'm trying to like <laughs> right, 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 say everything. And my my brain is my mouth is like, I cannot catch up to your thoughts. Please slow down. Please right. slow down. Right. Please. So, you you speak at the perfect speed for me. It's good. Okay. I've been Thank you. For Twenty me. years now, so I feel like I'm I'm talking like he was like New York on crack. Oh shit! Like, okay. Yeah, like really turn up the dial on a New Yorker, and then you've got the showrunner. Yeah, yeah. Not no. all showrunners, just this one. I mean, you've been in New York. 
I mean, you've been in New York City for how long now? Yeah, 20 years. I moved here in September of 2001. Woo! Literally days before 9-11. Wow! Did yeah. they come to your house then too? They're like, hi, <laughs> how did you move to New York City? You know, it's really funny because by the time I got to New York, I was like, no one knew, no one knew that I was Arab. Like I would walk down the street and people would look at me. They didn't know that I was Arab. So it was like such a different experience because in small town Ohio, everyone knew our business. Sure. And everyone knew, you know, we were Arab. But I got here and suddenly I was experiencing a whole different kind of racism, which was more like the fly on the wall kind of racism mm -hmm. where people feel comfortable being racist in front of you because they don't realize that you're a person of color. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the fun yeah, ones. How could she be a person of color? That's right. That's right. I, 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 when I lived in New York City when September 11th happened, and I grew up in New York, so for me, it's uh, it was pretty in my face. People, people would come and ask me. They're like, "You don't have any terrorists in your family, do you? Like, do you guys have any? Like, do you know any? I, I mean, uh, do you do you agree with what Osama bin Laden did? What the fuck are you talking about? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What are you talking about? Like, because I'm a lot browner than you are, Shireen. So I was definitely like being approached with like stupid ass questions. Like, oh, do you want to, like, you think, like, you think, uh, have terrorists ever tried to recruit you? I'm like, no, I'm too attractive. They don't att hire attractive people. <laughs> so, no, they did not ever come for me, you know? Uh, you know, they come for, I'm not, I'm not even a virgin. They're never going to hire me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> This is never gonna happen. It's just not in the cards for me, Shireen. It's just not in the cards for me. Yeah, I totally get it. I understand. I mean, it's ridiculous. So you're in you're in uh, New York City, and uh, how much? I mean, you must come to LA all the time. What is like? What? Why, why the preference of living in New York City versus in Los Angeles? You know, I just in New York, I feel like I'm like I live in the world. It's just between all of the languages spoken and all of the cultures and just I feel like it's like a microcosm of the world. Whereas in LA, it feels so much more homogenous and it feels a lot more American to me. Not that that's a bad thing, but yeah. I, I miss a little bit the diversity of like the just the languages that you hear walking down the street. I also miss the people. Like I go to LA and it's like, I, I mean, look, I love how relaxing it is and it's peaceful and like I love nature and the mountains. And all. It's beautiful. Yeah. Parts of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I miss walking and I miss people, you know? I, I feel like walking in LA is so, I mean, I remember when I lived there, I lived there when I was working on the L word and I would walk places and people would look at me like I was crazy. <laughs> <Maybe that's laughs> you know, walking or jogging in Jordan, you know? People that's look right. at me like I'm crazy. That's right. Do you, do you, can you, can you as a woman go jogging in Jordan? What is that like? You can, but you definitely risk being hit by a car. Oh, it's sure. not a very, it's not very pedestrian or jogging friendly, and, and you know the and and like uh, traffic can be super chaotic and all of that. So, um, and you definitely will get a lot of stares. You'll get a lot of yeah, people looking at you. Harassment catcalls. Um. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. Because in Pakistan, in my second feature film, actually. <laughs> Because in Pakistan, if I go running in the streets, people will be commenting on my titties and my ass. Like, that's straight up. <laughs> right. There you go. That's They're like, titties looking good. I'm like, thank you, sir. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> I like, titties, like bouncing and out. Now, as you yeah. get older, are people, are people that, like, in your face about it? Like, that that would be so ayyab. It's not ayyab. I don't know. Do you guys use that? Is that, like, a, a term that's... What is we use the, just the Arab wor world, ayab, which ayab is like a term that we use that means shame, like it's shameful, but yeah. it's just shameful. Like it's not just like you've shamed yourself. Like when you've done something that's ayab, you've literally shamed all of your people. I see. I it, see. So, so you're responsible for your tribe, for your family, for your people. And when you do something ayab, it's like a colossal shame. Like you've shamed everyone. <laughs> really, we uh, with us, it's more like uh, haya. Haya means uh, sharam, like or oh, sharam. Sharam means shame. So it would be more uh, like you know, like you know, like haya karo, meaning like be shameful. Like what are you doing? What are you out there like you know walking around with like your titties bouncing and your ass bouncing? Like I got good titties. What do you want? Like right. God gave them to me. People pay for these in LA. Come on, uh, you know exactly. 
It's like, come on, man. Uh, you don't get it? I don't know why. It's, you know, it's shame, right? It's uh, the woman's body is so sexualized. That the woman, it, yeah. Oh, man. It's the woman's body. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's so fucking taboo. Like, I mean, the and the thing between a woman's legs, like oh. that is the family honor right there. Like, it is... I, it's it's hard to believe that in this day and age we're still dealing with this. It's yep. still very much the case. Patriarchy, Shereen. Patriarchy. Yeah, yeah. Don't blame it on patriarchy. Everywhere. everywhere. Oh, it's everywhere. everywhere. Blame it on patriarchy. Honestly, yeah. I am just tired of family's honor constantly being put in a woman's vagina. Because once you put it up there, there's not a lot of room for anything else to go in there. So you need to take the family honor out because my vagina is too full. It's too yeah. full. It's heavy. It's full. I'm walking. I'm exhausted. It's a lot. It's a lot for that poor vagina to carry. You know, like it can't carry the shame of all of our people to like, come on. You can't even get a tampon in with that amount of yeah. like, you understand, like, you have to like, I can't even get a tampon in here. Like, <laughs> just like, you can all you get out of there already. Oh, it's like, geez, is there a string that I can just pull it out just like a tamp? Look, I need to pull, pull the fucking patriarchy out of your vagina. I just yank that shit out, man. Where is that fucking yank string? Right? I think there should be like an ad for like, like a fucking, uh, like a, uh, like a family honor tampon. Like just <laughs> yank it out. Yank it out. Totally. Nip that honor in the bud, man. Get it the fuck out. It doesn't belong there. Fucking exhausted, Shireen. I'm fucking exhausted of this shit. Shireen, how do you feel about this kind of, this family honor thing I'm talking about? It's prevalent in South Asian culture. It's prevalent, it's prevalent fucking everywhere. But it definitely in more in South Asian and Middle Eastern culture, especially predominantly Muslim countries, there is this thing where women are just constantly made to bear this fucking burden where we didn't even ask for it. Right. Do you feel even in communities here, uh, Middle Eastern communities here, uh, South Asian communities here, I definitely know about South Asian communities. Do you feel in Middle Eastern communities that is still very big, a, a very big part of the conversation, very big mentality that goes around? I think so, yeah. I think it's, you know, it might be a little bit more subtle than back home, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's not even more subtle. Sometimes, in fact, it's magnified because people immigrated to, you know, they immigrated to the States decades ago and they haven't realized that there's been progress in our part of the world. They're actually stuck in a bit of a time bubble, like in, you know, Palestine, like the village, of, you know, the tiny village of Palestine in circa 1974, 75 or something. So it's like this village mentality from the 70s that has not progressed. Yep. You know, and also, I just feel like it's so challenging when, you know, we come from we come from places where there's just so much work to do in our own cultures. But we're so busy, yes. like, you know, fighting outside, you know, you know, imperialism, colonization, the enemy, like occupation, like you know, God knows what threats from the outside that there's just no ability to even yeah. look at our own progress. Yes. To, you know what I mean? To really like do any work internally on our own situation. Sure. Don't you feel if the men in our societies, the, the toxic patriarchy that has dominated and continues to dominate and dictate the narrative, if they would if the allies, the male allies would step up and be like, listen, guys, this shade yeah. ain't working. This isn't working. Yeah. We need to treat our women equal to what's happening to us because we need our societies to progress, right? right. Do you feel that is happening here and back home? No, I don't. I don't. I, I mean, you know, sadly, if it is, I don't know about it, but I don't think it is. I, you know, and again, I, I have to, I have to wonder. I, I, yeah, I don't know why. Why do you think that is? Um, I feel uh, one of the factors is what you just said. They moved at in the 60s or 70s yeah. or even 80s and are just stuck in that while Pakistan has moved on. Uh, Jordan yeah. has moved on. Even Palestine has moved on. But they're still stuck in that mindset. But I feel also in America, I think it's about identity. It's about saying, we're going to hold on to this for dear life. Right, right. How fucked up it is. 
Don't ask me to look at it. Don't ask me to look at the fucked up stuff because you're asking me to shake my identity and I don't know who I am if you ask me to shake my identity. Right, right. No, that's a great point. I think that's really, really true. And I think that people do really hold on to their identities even more once they've left. And, you know, in Palestine, just given like, you know, the homeland is gone, basically, and people are just clinging to who they are and where they came from and their past and the hope of return. And, you know, what, because what else is there? Because the future is so, the present is so bleak and the future seems even bleaker. So, you know, it's like, and how do you, how do you org- how do you even organize internally? How do you even ma- like put a call out for for our allies, our our male allies, to even do anything? When you know when you look at like a culture like Palestine or a country like Palestine, where people are like the men have been so humiliated, they've been like completely uh, emasculated, and like they're living on their knees, and now you want them to you know? So it's like I do wonder why our male like our male allies here, I do, I sometimes feel like we have a hard time speaking out about some of our internal issues, like societal issues, Mm -hmm. um, because we're so criticized other, you know, the outsiders criticize our culture so much that sometimes it makes it harder for us to then be critical of our own cultures and of our own Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's also another reason why people sort of shield themselves with like, I'm going to focus on the occupation. I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to, I don't, let's not talk about these other things, like the way women are still being, you know, on or killed and whatever, whatever else is happening. We're going to brush these things under the rug, domestic violence and, you know, things that are real and that are happening. We just, we haven't gotten there yet to the point where we're ready to take out those taboos and look at them and go, you know what, what you're doing is wrong, but what we're doing is also wrong. That's right. That's right. But you mean, you know, that's the great thing, right? That's the great thing about you living in America and I living in America. We can have this conversation. We can, I can talk about this in my stand-up. I can right. talk about it on my live streams. You can go and make a film about it. You can have a live stream and talk about this thing, you know, or have a panel to be like, we want to have this discussion, right? Right, right. I feel, okay, wait, this is, this is my take on it. I get a lot of shit sometimes from fellow Pakistanis and fellow Muslims even, because I make fun of the dumb shit within the culture. And they don't like it. Especially, it's crazy, because when I make fun of terrorists, people get mad at me. And I was like, no, why are you getting mad? That's not pertain to you. Why are you getting upset at that? I'm just making fun of a dude who wants to blow himself up because he's going to get 72 pussies in heaven. (laughs) What a horrible deal. Virgin? Horrible. (laughs) Who wants that shit? I want 72 Chip and Dales in my heaven. Are you shitting me right now? I want them gyrating on me, know all the moves, like, fuck it. Some experience, yeah, exactly. Hello? Stupid. They don't like it. They don't like it. I get a lot of shit from them, especially Pakistani. That's surprising to me. Do you think men get the, do you think male, do you think your male counterparts get the same kind of shit? Because a lot of them also criticize Islam and the culture and, you know, terror, like yeah. terrorism. Yeah, well, they don't. Not the level that I do, because I'm a woman. Right. How dare you as a woman? Oh, as a guy, you are very, you are very bright. Let me hear what you have to say. Right, so, right. I would say the same shit and be like, oh, you self-hating right. Muslim, you self-hating Pakistani. And it's like, I am none of the above. I'm actually just pointing out, just like I point out the fucked up shit in American culture, I point out the fucked up shit in Pakistani or Muslim culture. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. my job. Number one, I'm an artist. Totally. One, everything else is secondary. Right? Number one, like that's where I come from. I'm a comic, yeah. first and foremost. I'm going to make fun of anything and everything. So like fucking, you, you know. Got you got to. Take a fucking deep breath. Like seriously, yeah. deep breath, you know? But yeah, I feel like I feel like there's also this thing about like, but you're a woman. Like, you know, when you do that, then, oh, you, if, when you make fun of our culture, that means you give license to for to everyone to make fun of us and i'm like so so what if you're just talking about the fucked up shit then we're just talking about the fucked up shit how do you fix something if you don't even acknowledge it right 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 how do you fix something like that shereen do you feel as a filmmaker of palestinian and jordanian background do you always feel like your films always need to have 
a topic or an issue it has to deal with? Do you always feel like it always has to be something about that? Like it has to speak something of that narrative or kind of counter a narrative? Like, do you always feel that kind of pressure? You can't just make a rom-com like Bridesmaids, you know? <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I do feel that, but I don't see it as pressure. I, I see it as responsibility and I see it as, um, it really, it's why I became a filmmaker. Like, so for me, it's like, um, I know other people might see that as like the burden of responsibility. And I totally get that. Like no one should have to feel that they're responsible to, to tell a counter narrative. But I actually became a filmmaker because I wanted to do that. Because I was like, I don't see myself represented. I don't see my people represented. I don't see this narrative anywhere. I want to tell. I want to. I want to give voice to this. I want to tell this narrative. And so, and I think, I mean, you know, film and television storytelling is just so powerful. You know, and comedy is so powerful. I mean, comedy to further like social change is really, really powerful. Yep. So I'm all for really taking the issues that I care about at whatever moment in time and, and really like finding a way to, to um, yeah, either infuse them into a story or tell a story about them, you know, that's engaging. And that's like, they can really be like a part of the, the zeitgeist that can be part of, you know, what people see as like, okay, this is, this is the conversation now. I can contribute to something, you know? Mm -hmm. You're um uh when you became a filmmaker, was that something that came as a shock to your family? Because, you know, immigrant parents, they expect you to become a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer. Like, those are very... No, it's not true. You know? I know, it's, it's so cliche, but it's so true. Like, my, um, when, I, when I first told my dad I wanted to be a filmmaker, I was young. I was, like, in my teens. And uh, he basically said, um, he said, you can't be a filmmaker. You're Arab. No one's going to care what you have to say. <laughs> yep. I was like, way to go, Dad. Super encouraging. Thanks for that one. Um, there, Dad. Me. Like, he really believed that. He really, really believed that at that time that no one would care what I had to say. And that's really sad for him that he believed that, you know? And luckily, times have changed and some people care. <laughs> I think a lot of people care now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it definitely came as a, it came as a shock, but yet it didn't because I started making home movies. I mean, like really, really hilarious, bad home movies when yeah. I was 12. Yeah. Like, like horror films in the cornfields of Ohio bad. And, um, so it didn't, so it wasn't a huge surprise when I told my parents, but when I told my dad, I got to Columbia film school, he was like, is there any chance you can go to Columbia law school? Wow. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. I was like, no, Dad, there's really not. But thanks yeah. for asking. Bye. Not too fucking shabby getting in Columbia film school. Excuse I me. Like, I was hoping for a little bit more approval. Yeah. That's why I do everything I do, Mona. I just, I want my dad's approval. I'm, I've just been working and working for him to just be uh, like, oh, I'm very proud of my first film, though. Uh, what about your mom? Is she very supportive? Your sisters? My mom and sisters are amazing. My mom uh, is super proud. Yeah. And my, my mom is definitely very supportive. Oh, uh, not hesitant. You know, for her, again, it was like the arts are a hobby. Like, you know, you need yeah. something else. Yeah. But, once she saw that I could actually make a living, she was like, oh, okay. This Listen, the moment money comes into the picture, the game changes. Totally. It's not a hobby anymore. Oh, you're making money. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So well, my family- do something now. <laughs> my mom is just like, I want to buy this bag and I saw these shoes and I want to buy so <laughs> Like, okay, all right. You were you weren't you were my family has never been supportive of anything. Like nobody in my family. I have four older brothers. Oh, no. Um, never. Fuck that. They were just like, what are you doing? My brothers refuse to watch my comedy. They refuse to come to my no. show. No. Oh, that's a bummer. Nothing. But I you know what? It's great. You know, you gotta you keep you do what you, you do you. Exactly. Shane, for me, it's great because by the time my special comes out, I'm like golden. So they haven't seen the shitty parts of my comedy. Yeah, totally. so That's awesome. That's, I, I like your style. I like yeah. your style. 
though. But the entire time they'll be like, oh my God, my sister was so talented. I'm like, you have no idea. I was eating shit for like 10 years. <laughs> like, oh my God, I sucked for so long. Uh, and now I'm finally good. So holy shit, this is, this is, but that's amazing though. Like, is your dad now more accepting and embracing of it? And it's just like, no, Shireen is established filmmaker. No, you know, I think he's still really surprised that I make a living. <laughs> he's still seriously very, like, I just, I kind of feel like he doesn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> is there, is this a thing in, in uh, Jordanian, Palestinian culture to be like, oh my God, you're 25 and you're not married? Oh my God, that's it. You are dead. You're basically oh, yeah. a fucking corpse. Like oh, you're yeah. oh yeah. Oh girl, in Arabic culture, it's like you're you're chasada. You're like too bad. Oh no. Oh, oh too bad. Oh, too bad. But, oh the daggers, Shireen, the daggers. <laughs> I know we even have oh. a to label it. It's oh my god. It's so and then and then oh my god, if you don't have a child, if you don't have a child. If you don't want to have a child and bring a child into this crazy, insane, fucked up, upside down world, exactly. I mean, that is like, how could you not? How selfish are you? <laughs> right. What is your purpose here exactly, Shireen and Mother Shake? Exactly. Why are you even here? What are you going to do with all that uterus? Oh, I'm sorry. The patriarchy and the <laughs> honor, the family honor is in there. So I can't. Great when you got out. Yeah. The family honor in there, so I can't shove a kid out of that. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, did your family kind of pressure you in your 20s and in your 30s to be like, get married, find somebody? Yes, yes, yes. And interestingly enough, though, you know, I identify as queer, and yeah. I was with women throughout all my 20s, and okay. that was awkward because I really couldn't have a kid with a woman. <laughs> Sure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you could. You could do a sperm, sperm bank. You could. Right. But yeah. not in the way that they want me to. Of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 The whole penetration process. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That that was not. I mean, it's possible, but not in the way that they want. Sure. Exactly. Exactly. It's just like, Dad, it's a turkey baster. Leave me alone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Leave me alone. Um. So, and did you, what age were you when you came out to your family and you're like, I'm queer? Like, and what was that like? Well, I, um, you know, I never came out to my dad, actually. He still, he still doesn't know. Um, shh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my... I can edit this, Shireen. <laughs> I don't think, he, he's not, he doesn't watch a lot of stuff, so I'm not too, too worried. Oh, but if he's listening, sorry, dad. Shireen, um, I think if you came up with a kid today, he wouldn't even care. He's just like, you have a kid. <laughs> I think it's good. Let's do this. Um, so, well, I'm married to a man now. So, you know, that's all I don't care about. Again, super awkward. So I'm like, I'm seen as a straight person in the world, which I'm not and don't want to be. But anyway, when I came out to my mom, it was like, oh, my God. It was, like, so dramatic. I mean, my mom was like, oh, my God, shitty. Oh my God. Whoa. Shitty, and this is so stupid. What? Yeah. All this beauty, all this talent out the window. It was like literally, I felt like she was like giving my eulogy at my funeral or something. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, really? My talent is gone too? Like, when did that happen? Yeah, apparently that happens. Like when you get become queer or you are queer, apparently that your talent disappears. Did you, know? you need to be straight to be talented? I didn't know. I mean, hey, my family does. I'm straight, and they still don't believe I'm talented. So it doesn't fucking, you can't win, Shireen. You can't fucking win. That's you, can't win. you can't win. You can't fucking win. That's wow, man. Wow. So you're married to a man, and now did you marry a white guy? No, I'm an Iranian. Oh. I'm here from the region, girl. Oh, yeah. Okay, Iranian. What's up? Okay. Yeah, what's up? Did you guys have a, a Iranian style wedding or was it like a quiet wedding? It was, you know, I wanted a quieter wedding. <laughs> Let's just say that. Yeah. I kind of wanted a really quiet, like an eloping kind of a wedding. Okay. Um, but no, we had we we had a lovely wedding. It was um it was family, like family, closest family and friends. It was super chill. It was sort of bohemian. It was a little you know, we had our, our Iranian sofra, and it was really. Oh, I love that. 
There was no dupke. There's no dupke dance. Oh, there was spontaneous dupke for sure. Oh, fabulous. The yeah, there was Arabic and Iranian music. Yeah, we had and and, and American. I mean, it was like a whole hot Love it. Love, love that. Especially those like hot Palestinian guys. Like I was like, oh, honey, goodness. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, do the dub gay. Yeah, something about that life. Okay. It is a really, it's really beautiful to watch people do the dub gay. I mean, it's a really it's beautiful. beautiful. I mean, I, I, I can barely do it. Like, but when I see people, it's who are amazing. I'm just like, it's hard. It looks, I mean, it looks when people do it well, they make it look so easy, yeah. and then you do it, and you're just like, okay, I, I, can I just belly dance? Because I'm a little better at that. <laughs> just a little bit, not much. Dude, my knees would blow out. Are you shit? I know, right? One going yeah, down. I'm, down not down. Down. I'm, not, oh, yeah. I'm not coming back up. Well, I'm, I'm, I go down. Oh, I go down. Yeah. I am not coming back I'm up. I'm lifting you back up. I hear yeah, you. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. With us, it's more like the light changing, like light bulb changing dances for us. So it's a yeah, little yeah, 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 yeah. You're yeah. not really getting down to it so much. So that's right. good. You know? So yeah, if you have bad knees, you're good. Like you're good. Like it's all up here. You're, you're totally, yeah, you're fine. No problem. You're, you're fine. Um, I mean, my God, um, I know, uh, I know that we are on a limited time. So I want to, I want to get into, uh, you directing, uh, the amazing Rami. I love Rami Youssef. Rami has been on my minority reports, live shows at the comedy store. I have done podcasts with him. He's just so wonderful. He's so wonderful. What was that like? Did they contact you? Did Rami was just like Shireen? Shireen, come, come in, you know, direct uh, an episode. What was that like? Yeah, well, uh, Rami and I have a mutual friend um, who introduced us, and so, um, so yeah, Rami and I were in touch directly from the very beginning, and yeah. he wanted me to come on board and direct a block of episodes from the very beginning, and and he he always knew that he wanted me to direct the episodes about the women and that sort of standalone episodes and. Um, it, it was amazing. In season one, I did four episodes, and you know, was really a part of um, the you know the creative conversations around some of them, and and um, yeah, it was really so much fun to be part of a show that to me felt like coming home. Yeah. Because, you know, it's just like it's my culture, it's my family, it's my people, it's my language. Like you know, Arabish somewhere between Arabic and English, where it's just like dual language and. Arab American, and it was so much of what I could relate to, and yes. it was, so it was really amazing to be a part of kind of the first show of its kind, and to help kind of you know birth it into the world, and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been really exciting. I directed four episodes in season one, and two episodes in season two. Did you direct the one about the mom going through the crisis? Where she I did. French guy and she's smoking and she's, yeah. like, she's like, oh my God, I'm a liberated French woman and oh, I'm yeah. all this way. I love that episode so much. Honestly, of all the episodes, I, I thank you for telling me that you directed it and it makes me so happy that a woman directed it because you can just tell it has that woman touch on it. But I remember watching that episode and being like, yes, thank you. Thank you for showing that one. That's important. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's really, I love hearing that because that, I love that episode. Um, and I always loved, like when I, the moment I got that script, I loved it. I knew that that script was really special and I knew that that episode was going to be really special. And that episode reunited me with um, the great Palestinian French actress, Tiam Abbas, yes. who I now worked with like four different times in that's both right. feature films and yes. in Mommy seasons one and two. Yes. And so it was amazing to like reunite with her. And then we shot at White Castle, which was like, you know, it felt like a throwback to America because America, you know, there's the, the main character ends up getting a job at White Castle. So it was just a really <laughs> amazing experience that really, like I said, like kind of brought me back to my origins as a filmmaker. You know, Shireen, one thing um, I love the second season, of course, I love the first season. One thing, you know, I, I noticed about uh, the the characters is that every character has uh, has its own distinct backstory. And you and Rami really kind of takes the time to kind of go in and delve in and try to really make them multidimensional. So it's not like just all Rami, but the, he also goes and explores these the backstories of these different characters. It's funny because the uncle played, uh, the, the guy who plays uh, Lace Knockley, who plays yeah. the uncle, um, is my former uh, act, uh, acting classmate from New York. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> what is happening right now? This is amazing. 
Uh, and he's so great. He's so talented. He's so great. Um, yeah. One thing, you know, I was noticing, and uh, please tell, tell me uh, if, like, you know, uh, one thing I noticed about the first se season and the uh, and the second season is that the sister never gets laid. I know. Girl, I tried. I mean, look, I... um. Can we get her laid, Shireen? I'm with you. I'm with you. I think that that I think that that needs to happen. It's really funny because I actually protested in season one that she was a virgin at all. I was like, really? Like, isn't that kind of what's expected? Um, not even a finger. Like, not even two. Like, come on, it's not, nothing. I know. Well, she did get hot and heavy, and she really wanted to go all the way. But that guy, like, I mean, fetishizing her. That was the story. We, you know. It was, there was a lot of back and forth on that episode in particular. And there, you know, it's interesting in television because you have so many different voices chiming in. You know, we've got the, the creator and the showrunner and um, sometimes the writer is a different person. And on that episode, it was a different, I believe it wasn't, yeah, it was a different person. It was like, those are three people. And then you've got the producers and then you've got the studio executives and you've got the network executives. So you've got a lot of layers of people. And by the time I came on board as a director, they had been through numerous iterations of that script. Wow. Some of which were like, no bueno. Like, no, you don't wanna, you know, there's a lot of confusion around what Arab women, how Arab women should be portrayed. You know, like it was almost like you could tell there were too many voices mm. um, contributing to that particular story. Yeah. Yeah. So ultimately, though, I think we landed on something that that worked well. I'm with you. Let's get her late. I was like, every, you know, everybody's getting late. I was like, okay, Rami's getting late the most, and I get it. He's, <laughs> he's getting so much plus. Good for him. Congrats. I was like, but what about the sister? Let's get the sister get laid. Come on. I know. I know. Just a little bit, like you know. Um, right. Maharshala Ali, who's in the second um, season and does a phenomenal job because he is a phenomenal actor. I remember being at a studio meeting and this guy named Maharshala Ali comes and sits next to me. I don't know who he is, but I hear people walking around and whispering to each other. So I, I, I'm just like, maybe he's somebody big. I just don't know because I'm an idiot. I, I never watched House of Cards. I didn't know. <laughs> So I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, hey man, how you doing? Is it good? I'm like, Mahershala Ali. So that's a Jewish and a Muslim name? So which one are you? And he goes, he starts laughing. He's like, are you a New Yorker? I'm like, yeah, can't you tell? He goes, yeah. Uh, for 30 minutes, we were both waiting for our meeting. For 30 minutes. That's amazing. Oh, my God. His entire journey, how he converted to Islam. Oh, wow. Told me the entire backstory. That's amazing. And I was just like, oh, man, that is so, such a great. He was like, I was like, he was like, I was a young actor. I was lost. I was looking for at the Baha'i faith. I was looking at a bunch of different religions. And he goes, I remember being at a bodega in New York City and you know and they were so it's Friday and they're going to pro to the prayer the Friday prayers and I'm like hey can I oh Sherry can you hear me oh there you are I can hear oh. you yeah and he's like yeah. frozen he's like long story short I go to the masjid and I hear the prayers and he goes and I start crying and I don't know why I'm crying wow and he's like wow. I go home that night and I can't stop crying and I can't stop thinking about how touched I was when I hear the prayers. Wow. So he shows up to the bodega again and he goes, hey, are you going to the masjid again? I wanna come. And they're, so they're like, okay, all right, dude. All right, you can join us. And then they turn and looked at him, the guy who took him and goes, he goes, you're not Muslim, are you? He goes, no, he goes, but I'm looking at different faiths and I was like, you know, I heard the prayers and it really touched my heart. And he goes, would you like to convert? And he goes, yes. So he, uh, he says, that quick. That quick. Wow. That quick. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then he gets up and he's about to leave and he was like, say that again. That's profound. It's so profound. So profound, you know? And he ended up marrying a, a black Muslim woman from Chicago whose father 
was the head imam of a masjid there. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Are you raised Muslim, Shireen? Are you guys Muslim? No, my, I was raised Christian. My parents oh, no. were Okay, is that Coptic? Um, Coptic Christ Christianity is really in Egypt. Um, in, in Palestine, it's a lot of Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic. Oh. Which so, is what my parents are. So you guys are raised like uh, Greek Orthodox? Yeah, yeah, Greek, Greek Orthodox and, and Catholic. Hardcore, dude. <laughs> I was married to a super religious growing up, so it wasn't a big part of, of, my, um, okay. of my upbringing. Okay. Yeah, I, and now I'm actually a Buddhist practitioner. Oh, love that. Love, yeah. love that. I was married to a Greek man in New York. You were married to a Greek man in New York? I was married to a Greek man in New York, and he was very Greek Orthodox. Every morning, he would wake up and cross himself. He had his whole shrine and everything, and he would come to the mosque with me, and I would go to the Greek church with him. It was quite the quite the experience, to say the least. Yeah, that's wow. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, I, I love going to the I love going to the Greek church because they're so beautiful. Um, but I would sit there because I'm an asshole. I'd be like, because the entire sermon would be in Greek. And I'm like, that's Greek to me. And he's like, shut <laughs> up. And he's like, uh, yeah, it is. He's like, hello. I'm just like, I ju I'm just here for the food. I'm like, can I just get some good food? It is really good food. <laughs> yeah, because Easter is a very big deal, right? In Greek Orthodoxy. Huge, yes. And it's my mom's favorite holiday, even though my mom, my mom always thought the Greek Orthodox were a little too strict for her. Yeah. Um, but Easter has always been a favorite holiday. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, Easter is a very big deal. So I would just sit there and just like wait for like the delicious soups that they would make and all the yummy food and the baklava and all that. And I'm just like, I don't care. I listen to the sermon. I get free food. I don't care. <laughs> I, don't care. I will listen to this. I don't know what they're saying, but I'm sure it's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> my God. Shreen, how has the pandemic been for you? Are you working on any projects? What's going on? It's been actually, I mean, it's been a really highly creative time. Yeah. Um, it really like turbo boosted a lot of things, like a lot of, you know, just development. Every just Everyone just wanted to develop. And so suddenly yeah. it's like, okay, let's turn the dial up on everything I'm developing. So it's been just a lot of writing, a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of Zoom pitches, a lot of Zoom. <laughs> oh, is there such a thing? Okay, are you experiencing Zoom exhaustion? It's a real thing. Yeah. Zoom fatigue, yeah, it's a thing. It's a real thing. I'm like, you do everything on Zoom these days. It's like literally everything. I'm taking French classes on Zoom. I'm doing my meditations, my meditation classes on Zoom. Oh, wow. I'm an acting class on Zoom. Oh, wow. Yeah. How you got, so you probably, I've been taking acting classes on Zoom. So we t I tape it, I send it in, and then yeah. they give you the critique. They play it on, and then they tell you, you're like, oh, you you suck. Go back to stand up. <laughs> Go back to square one. Do that again. Go back to stand up comedy. Um. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Are you acting also, Shireen, now? Are you acting in your stuff? Are you acting in other, you know, other projects? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's been a little while since I've since I've done since I've focused on the acting and since I've done it, um, frankly. But I, yeah, I'm totally open, and I've been exercising that muscle now for you know. I mean, I've never really stopped. So yeah, and I intend to continue to act in my own work when it's when it's appropriate, and you know, when there's a role and when it's appropriate. So yeah, I'm excited to do it. Yeah, and there's there's always like little opportunities that come about here and there, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say highly creative. Are you, do you have a film you're working on right now? Like, what are you working on? I do, yeah. I have a couple of feature films that I'm working on, um, two two films that I'm working on, one that's actually set here in the U.S. and then one that's set in Palestine. Okay. And then I have three shows that I'm in different stages of development on, one that I'm actively pitching, well, two that I'm actively pitching. Well, one and a half. <laughs> one that I'm actually pitching and another one that I'm getting very close to going out with. Got it. Got it. So uh, I know you also directed Ozark. Yes. That was amazing. That that must have been. How many episodes did you direct of Ozark? I did two episodes. You directed two episodes. Yeah. And what was that like? Like, holy shit. I mean, Ozark's a 
what the show. It's um yeah, it's super intense. Um, but but also really really kind of awesome. Like I've always been such a massive fan of Jason Bateman. Um, yeah, you know, been watching him since I was a kid. Since he, he was, was a kid. A, he, lives in, he lives in my neighborhood. Oh really? I see him in my whole street. guy. He's really really lovely. Yes, he is. Um, and he and and he actually really taught me something I think really valuable as a director, uh, which is not to take myself so seriously, because I can do that. I tend to do that when I'm directing. You know, it's just like, oh my god, there's so much responsibility and there's so much to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was actually quite nervous that the first day that I was going to be directing him because he had just directed the block right right before me. So I was like, oh, you know, he just directed himself. Which was awesome, by the way. I got to watch him direct himself. I mean, sure. that was like a serious masterclass in acting yeah. and directing at the same time. And then, so then I was directing the block after him. And the first day he showed up to set, he walks up to me and I was like, hey, Jason, how are you? And he was like, I'm great. Do you know why? Because all I have to do today is act. Uh -huh. On over to you. And he did this little bow and I was like, I love you. <laughs> he's a sweetheart, isn't he? he just, he's the same probably way he's on screen as he is off screen. He just, you can just yeah. tell that. He is just constantly cracking jokes. He really, I mean, he's such a funny guy. He's really, I mean, uh, constantly laughing at himself, yeah. which I just really appreciate. And sure. again, that was part of the lesson of just like, don't ever take yourself too seriously. Always yeah. laugh at yourself. Yeah. And he really did. He really did. Like there was just like, he, and Laura Linney did as well. Interestingly enough, it was like they, they both had this thing of just like, you know, if they weren't feeling a take, it was just like, okay, and that was some bad acting. <laughs> caliber saying that, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just yeah. like, oh, that's really amazing. I feel like it also as a as a creative person, you know, because you have all this responsibility, you know, but you also have to be in that creative space when you keep it kind of limber. Right. You know, more stuff flows through. It's a lot easier. Totally. It's a lot easier. You know, it's rather than yeah. me being like all intense about going on stage. It's like we're just packing jokes backstage and like shooting the shit. And then you're just calling called out and then you just go up and you just do your set and just have a good time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. But you know, it's so interesting because, you know, on sets, it so so often the the tone of the set is really like from the top down, right? So yeah. Yeah. The people with the most power, if they are really big egos or if they're like really stressed out or if they're like just shitty, you know, they, they treat people like shit. Yeah. Then yeah. that starts to filter down and you find that there's just tension on set. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like a sponge. Like I just soak up other people's energy. So if there's tension, I'll find myself getting tight in my body and I'm just like, you know what I mean? So, so it's so refreshing to be on a set where someone like Jason Bateman, who's like, you know, he's the most powerful, powerful person on that set. Sure. Um, as a as a producer on the show as well, and someone who was sure. really involved early on, and he's laughing nonstop. So you so you can relax, you know, even though it's an intense shoot and you're moving quickly yeah. and you're you, you're doing all these things you can relax and you don't have to worry and people are generally relaxed and having fun and you know. Yeah, yeah. Really you understand? Nice. It goes back to the point about everything trickles from the top, right? Yeah. Everything trickles yeah. from the top, right? Yeah. If you have shitty people sitting up top, it's gonna to be a garbage set. If it's like awesome, totally. fun people, it's gonna be an awesome, fun set. Like that's totally. what it's gonna be. Um, speaking of shitty people, um, I've, had, I've had various, uh, female directors on here um, and I love talking to them about this. I mean, look, it's hard enough to navigate your way as a female in the world, but then you put yourself in a space of Hollywood and then in a position of director. I mean, you have, I feel pretty beautifully kind of navigated your way mainly because you've also, you also had a very unique and a very, you know, very, very clear, kind of storytelling that you wanted to do. So people knew like, okay, this is what Shireen is about. Like Shireen is telling this story. We get it. We get it where she comes from. For you, when you go on sets, besides the ones you experienced in Ozark, has it been where you go on sets and male or even female, you know, lead actresses or actors are just like, it's a first time director. I don't need to, whatever, whatever. You don't have power, I do. 
Uh, yeah, I definitely have had that. I've, I've had that experience. Um, I, I've had it on sets. I've had it in writer's rooms. Um, I've had it in meetings. I've had it uh, in the hiring process. I mean, it, yeah, it's, I've had some, yeah, it's really, it's really fucked up. And it's interesting too, because people always ask me, oh, what's it like to be a, a, women, a woman director in the Arab world? Like, what's it like when you work there? And I'm like, you know, I've only been treated with the utmost respect as a woman mm. director in the Arab world. Mm. As a woman, that's a different story. <laughs> you know, oh, as a woman director. Yes. I am like treated like I am like by the way, like of pa like Palestinian and Arab directors, yeah. I think it's like 50-50. There are like as many women directors in the Arab world as there are men. Like it's ludicrous how many women directors there are in the Arab world. It's literally crazy. That's amazing. But yeah, in this country, I've had a lot of really crazy experiences and definitely a lot of attitude and people testing me. Like I once showed up on a set mm. and an actress. Um, very established actress? Very established actress. Uh, very much tested me from the moment I arrived. It was, it was, was questioning where the camera was, was questioning the camera move, asked to see playback at, at Video Village. And, and I, and she, it was literally my first day of shooting. It was like my first scene. And, um, and I, I, you know, I handle these things very well because I, I'm sort of like, I don't care who you are. I'm here doing my job and I'm just, I'm, I'm going to listen to you and accommodate you and, and we're going to work together, but I'm also going to share my opinion and be, be opinionated and I'm not going to allow you to like make me shrink. Like that's just not who I am. I don't shrink. You're the captain of the ship. Yeah, and but you know, but a lot of women direct, like a lot of women in that kind of situation would, you know, because it is quite, it is quite intimidating. And I totally, I have a bit of an opposite reaction where like the rebel in me comes out and like yeah. you will not shrink me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I will pull up my lasso. I you know it's like the Palestinian in me. I'm like yes. I'm not in boxing. Yes. I'm here to defend myself. That's but, the Palestinian um, in you for sure, Shuri. <laughs> But it was interesting because at one point um, I apparently passed the test and, and to pass the test, I had to be a combination of strong, opinionated, uh, but willing to accommodate and listen, uh, which I naturally did. And then apparently I passed the test. And then later the, the script supervisor, who was a woman, said to me, I just want you to know that she never does that with men. She has uh, never done that with the women directors on the show. And I was like, that is so disappointing, Shuri. I know. It's really disappointing. That's really shitty. I mean, you know, that goes back to that internalized misogyny. It's not just the men. Women have it too. I know. They really do. Women definitely have it too, for sure. I was just up for actually a big, um, well, like a big indie film starring mm -hmm. like a big name actress and and it was between me and someone else and i i never really knew who the other person was mm. i just it was between me and someone else and mm. um the producers and financiers wanted me i had like three different interviews with them and they wanted me and they were apparently fine and i had a call with the actress and it went really well and yeah and then i was suddenly hearing that the producers and financiers were fighting for me and i was like well if you're fighting for me but you're financing the whole movie yeah, Who's fighting, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, they're fighting the actress." Yeah. And then I heard that they hired a white man, who was the other person who was up for the gig, who's like actually been around for a lot longer than me, and all of that. But I was like, "It's so interesting to me that it was the act. It came down to a woman's decision, you know." And, but this is the kind of thing that just I feel like happens a lot, a lot, a lot. You know, Shireen, one of the things that I uh, do, not just as a cinema comic, but as a producer, I put on a, I put on a lot of big shows in LA and also in New York. My number one key thing every time, it has to be all women. Yeah. It has to be all women. They have to be all women. Yeah. Middle Eastern. We did Arab, awesome. girls, we did Arab girls night out here, packed sold out that's awesome ladies losing their minds losing their goddamn <laughs> all arab female comics yes yes oh my god we've never been to a show like that exactly we need this i i need to 
showcase and and put forward these amazing incredible talent because the comedy clubs aren't giving us those breaks so fuck it i'll just fucking create a platform for all of us yeah that's awesome that's so great I yeah, mean, for you, man. that shit disappoints me it disappoints it really disappoints me yeah no it's really it is really interesting women are women are definitely part of the patriarchy you know it's not it, it is not a gender divide it's really like it's a system that has just brainwashed a lot of a lot a lot of fucking people and it doesn't matter what gender you are listen 53 percent of white women voted for trump so, so let's not forget that right that's a, that's a hard number that's a hard number like yeah. let's not forget that right uh the, the those one were like yeah he can grab me by the pussy it's just oh, like oh god oh that was so horrible i can't Ooh. believe that a woman would say that i remember seeing those like videos and like what what why what i don't get it i don't understand i'm like he can't grab you by the pussy you have no thigh gap it, he can't literally <laughs> <get it. laughs> what are you talking about there's nothing to grab. There's nothing to grab. He's got to, you know, you know how much fat I got to get through even through my own? <laughs> you can't even grab your own pussy. You know how Come difficult on. it is? Come on. Stop it. But, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real thing. You know, we, uh, we had a women's march take place in uh, Pakistan. And the older ladies really? were shaming. Yeah, the older ladies were shaming the younger ladies. Oh. And saying, this is not what freedom is about. I don't want you going out there. All they were wearing were jeans. Jeans and just a top. Oh, that is not. And I was like, could tell with all due respect, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. Nobody yeah. needs your shit. Listen, you maybe have another 20 years to live. You're probably going to die soon. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> we're the ones carrying the fucking future. <laughs> we're the ones raising the children. Right. Shut up. Shut right. up. You know? Right. Right. Did, Jordan, did Jordan have a women's march? No, I don't think so. No. That's another thing right there. No, my mom and sister live there. I feel like I would have heard about that. But no, so wait, did this happen? Was th I mean, obviously it's COVID now, so nobody, I don't think anybody's having. Yeah, no, no. This is like last yeah, year. Last year. Okay. No. Yeah. yeah. Oh, can't, can't take it to the streets. Why the fuck not? What yeah. about the thing? Your ass is whooped every day. We're being told we have no representation in legislation. Nobody acknowledges us when they, they make rules and pass this fucked up Wahhabi laws telling us that we have to consistently cover ourselves and that, you know, there, there was a rule in Pakistan that if a woman gets raped, she needs four male witnesses to verify her rape. Four oh, male witnesses. God. If you are a fucking male witness, like, like, the fuck you doing fucking witnessing it? Wouldn't you stop the rape? Yeah, right. Oh my God. That's just horrific. Yeah, no, we, there's some, yeah, we have a lot of work to do, Mona. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. So Not just over there, over here. I mean, it's exhausting being a woman and a woman of color, especially right now. You know, it's like, Jesus yeah. Christ. you know, and you know what kills me sometimes is that your own men or even your own women try to like fight you and try to, you're just right. like, I'm right. fighting for all of us. This right. is not just for me. This is for all of us. I do this for all of us. Like, right. come on, work with me, work with me. I had some ladies uh, show up to a show I did here. 300 Indian and Pakistani women showed up to the show, right? Packed to the front. It was incredible, right? They show up and the very same day, some of the older Pakistani ladies took it upon themselves to go on the, on Facebook and comment how disappointed they were at the show. Why everybody had a grand old fucking time. Because why? I told a story, which is a true story, about me performing the holy pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia and shitting my pants as an 11 year old. I talked about shitting my pants. Oh, it was so offensive. Because oh God. As I shit my pants, I didn't shit my, I didn't say anything against the faith. I just talk about shit in my pants. That's what the story is about. <laughs> and these bitches couldn't keep it to themselves. So yeah. the part was when they started talking shit, all the younger ladies came in and they were like, oh, you women. Oh, you started already? Oh, somebody puts out a good thing and you have got to come and knock that shit down. So that was the great part where a lot of the younger people were stepping in and they're like, this is fucked up. Like, really, just shut up. 
Shut your mouth. Just sit on the yeah. side. Yeah. Don't you have an arthritis medication to take? Your blood pressure must be shooting up. Fucking sit on the side. It's, <laughs> it's exhausting. It's fucking exhausting, Shereen. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I wouldn't sorry. trade it for the world, though. I wouldn't trade it for the world, either. No, yeah. I wouldn't, either. You know, uh, Shereen, I know we went a little bit over time. Thank you for being That's okay. It was so great to talk to you. Yeah, so much. Thank you. Me too. This was such a great conversation. Um, yeah, where can we follow you, Shireen? Where can we follow you? On Instagram, Twitter, at Shireen Diabas. Which um, is? La la last name? How do you spell it? D A B as in boy, I S. That's not your married name. That's your. No, it's my. I, 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 yeah, I'm not very conventional in that way. Oh shit! Okay, Shireen. Yeah, this is my this is my name, my palace. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's a female. Uh, there's a there's a comic here, uh, Monrock. She's great. She's Indian, and uh, she makes this great joke that uh, women only have two options: you only take your father's name or your husband's name. You don't really have a name for yourself, which is such a great and amazing point. So, yep. uh, if I adopt if I adopt children. Yeah. I'm going to make sure that they have my first and last name. That's great. I'm going to freaking make sure of that. Like you, yeah. you, you have more. So when I die, you better carry this fucking name. You better carry it. <laughs> I will haunt you in your dreams. I will haunt you. Like, take, take that last name. I think, um, I think that's the right approach right there. <laughs> you got to take my name. You got to take my first name. Like, Jesus Christ. You know? It's ridiculous. You guys do the, the thing because Arabic culture, like you don't give kids middle names. Your dad's first name automatically becomes your middle name. Oh, my middle name is Nazi. Oh, Nazi Diabas. Although I have like more like five names. If you really want to know, like it's just a long, it's a lot of names. Got it. Women in our family do not have middle names. Okay, afford it. It's too expensive. Uh, it's only the boys. Only the boys get the middle names. We don't. We don't get the middle names. Wait, how is it too expensive? I was being sarcastic. <laughs> like, what does it cost money to register a name? Apparently, <laughs> apparently, I was like, why don't I get a middle name? Why don't I get a picking it? Why do my brothers get middle names? I don't get a middle name. Really funny because my husband, who's Iranian, also like they don't have middle names, and I was like, is that a cultural thing? He was like, I don't know. I think I it might. Know. Be, I think it might be a cultural thing. Yeah, for us, it's. Uh, for us, it's more about the women don't get it. The men, because the women are going to mm -hmm. leave anyways. They're going to take the husband's name. Right. And it's so crazy. That's so crazy that the women are just, you know, my dad, my, I have four sisters. So we're like five girls. Oh, wow. So like, they basically five rocking women now. I love that. Love and it. my mom, as the matriarch growing up, we were just a feminist household. Like literally my dad was like, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> He's Two outnumbered. Girls. Dude, he's outnumbered. He's not going to win this year. Massively outnumbered, and but basically, you know, the reason my parents have five kids is because they tried five times for a boy. Of course, they did. <laughs> so, I we mean, how important that tradition of carrying the name is. So, yeah, let's just start giving the name to the daughters. The girls, yeah, the daughters. Yep, and whoever carries it, listen, it's not a guarantee that you'll have a son and then he'll have kids. And the name dies. Right. So diversify your portfolio. Give it to the daughter too. <laughs> That's what, this is what I'm talking about, you know? I think that's right on. Diversify your freaking portfolio. Five dollars. I am the opposite of you. I grew up with four older brothers, a very alpha oh, dad. Wow, brothers, man. How what was that like? So much fucking testosterone train. Oh man. Let me tell you something. I didn't know I was a girl till I was eight. Oh, wow. My mom had to sit me down and I was like, why is it that when I pee standing up, it's messy. And when they do it, <laughs> it's not. What is happening here? Is this something I don't know about? <laughs> Did I miss that day of school where they taught us how to do that? What happened? Is my target, is it my target practice is not good? Maybe I'm not aiming right? Like what's happening here? And my mom was just like, no, you don't have the same same weaponry that they do. I was like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean? And uh, it was really, can I tell you something? I was pretty devastated when I learned I was a girl. Pretty devastated. Yeah, because I saw what was happening to women around me. They were being 
Right, right. You know, they were being told that they were, but for me, I think what happened with me, because I saw boys in my family just do whatever. So I was also doing whatever. Right, right. And, you know, so I was a top boy. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Which is a cool guy, by the way. Say that again. I was a tomboy too. Yeah, I yeah, to yeah. My, my, I tried to be my dad's son. Yeah, I could be a boy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Look, I can tuck these titties in. Look, check it out. <laughs> totally. They're not that big. They're not that noticeable. Oh, exactly. Marie, let me tell you something. When I moved at fifteen, I had no titties, and when I moved to America and started drinking that that milk and that started eating that food, <laughs> my titties just went. <laughs> Wow. In like one and a half year. And my mom came and she was yeah. visiting. And my mom was like, what happened to your chest? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? She's like, what happened? It's too, it's too big. Cover it. <laughs> and I was just like walking. I was like, oh, shit. I got to like cover these like up. And as an adult, I'm like, fucking people pay for these. What? People pay for them. They do. I don't know what happened in my family because my sisters have like massive boobs. Really? Yeah. And I don't know if, because I was a dancer growing up and I was like a bit of a contortionist and I was always like rolling over my chest doing these contortionist moves. So yeah. I smashed them down or something, you know, they're just. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, Shereen. <laughs> so, I mean, they fit really nicely in my hands, but they're not like, you know, my sisters are like, like what you're talking about, you know, or like. But interestingly enough, like I was the tomboy growing up. So I think I also would have been horrified if I would have like, you know, like I, yeah. I don't know if I just you did wearing a lot of did my growth as an anorexic when I was 12. <laughs> You've been wearing a lot of baggy t-shirts. Let's just put it that way. Right. I'd be wearing probably like, I mean, because I was like literally rolling over my chest doing these like weird things. Yeah, I would have been really wearing a lot of sports bras. I would have had the uniboo with the sports bras, you know? Well, listen, uh, uh, if our if our men can have unibrow, why can't the women have unibrow? Come on. I know. It's I know. Totally fair. Yeah, no, I, I think for me it was it was something that I was very ashamed of, you know? Because uh -huh. I was made to feel this shame. Like, my mom was like, oh, my God, cover it up. This is awful. Uh -oh. My mom belongs to the itty-bitty titty committee, so she couldn't understand how the fuck I was rocking. Like, right. Where did those come from? Exactly. She's like, well, and you know what she tells me now? She's like, that is from your father's side. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, hey, man, I was like, they got rock going on. I was like, you got small titties, bitch. I was like, don't put that shit on me. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I got good titties. Like, I'm good. I'm, I'm really good right now. Yeah, my mom is, I think she still is like a little, she's always just like covered it up. And I'm like, I'm trying to like show a little more cleave now. The yeah. older like, the titties are going. They're gonna fucking go. No, let me enjoy not, them. Let them go. And you know what? Right now in quarantine, it is all about the titties being free. Right. It's all about you know what? People are gonna look back one day at the bra and it's gonna be like the corset is to us. Like yeah. how yeah. did women wear that? Why yeah. did we, that is so uncomfortable? Like, isn't yeah. it time that we moved on from the bra to find something just a little bit more flexible? Agreed. I agree. I wouldn't even mind like a guy that I like and have his hands molded and just have oh. them, like, top, like under my shirt. Like, I'm just like, oh, these are so soft, like made of rubber, just rubbers holding your titties up all day. Nice. Something like that, right? I mean, can you copy, can you trademark that? You're copyrighted or whatever you got to do to like get that shit moving? Start manufacturing it. Let me get working on that right now. <laughs> this is all these great ideas. See, this is what happens when great minds come together. Totally. Like totally. the tippy ideas, like all of this is just coming through. It is, man. This is amazing. Uh, I know it's late for you, so I'm not going to keep you any further. Uh, can you please come back again? Because this was so I much fun. You. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed uh, it so much. You, you are awesome. Are you coming to LA anytime soon? Are you coming to LA? You know, I, I I was supposed to come there, and I have no idea now with the whole you know situation yeah. that we're in. I I spent usually spend a lot more time there, but yeah. next time I'm there, I will definitely hit you up because I would love to see you. Yes, me too. I would love to. Yeah. I would love to uh, go have some. Uh, I don't know, some tea or some dinner or something. I don't know. Be great. We'll go yeah. to we'll go to. Uh, <laughs> 
We'll go to Tehranjalis. We'll go to Tehranjalis. We could do that. Totally. Yeah, we'll totally go to Tehranjalis. Thank, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you so much thank for joining. You. Thank you. Thank you. I will see you Good soon. Night. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. That was a wonderful and amazing Shireen Diabis. I hope I said that. I, I think I said that right. You guys, this was such a fun chat. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely did. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, it would mean the world to me if you do so. It would be awesome. Um, until Monday with a brand new guest. I love you. Thank you always for tuning in and supporting. Have a lovely weekend. Stay safe out there. Have a good night.